Uh, hi guys, uh, uh, so welcome ladies and gentlemen and uh, it's really great to have Bob the Builder today and uh, so the way we plan the lecture is going to go for an hour and we have 15 minutes of uh, question at the end from the audience to come in so feel free if you have any questions just pop in straight off uh, but yeah before I go on to also introduce uh, our guest lecture today so I just wanted to tell you about why organizing this lecture was really important and I'm so sorry I guess I have to bear this uh, in the academia, we have been very critical of those who don't really come from the same discipline and some of the greatest scholastics have been working hand in hand with the higher institutions. But we have some, in some ways forgotten our roots. Uh, truly as a philosopher, I still believe that we, sh you know, we should gobble down the block for the pursuit of truth and I think as Cicero said, you know, the strong cannot fought in adversity. And it is this passion and the faith in Christianity that has got Bob at the pedestal where he is. And as students of philosophy, we see ourselves faltering into this very one sense of restricted ideology uh, in the academia or rather we fall into these jaws of academic dogmatism and I think we've really got a lot to learn from Bob today uh, and you know I think Bob has really shown us this path of true stoicism where you know it's more of this exchange of dialogue that happens in philosophy and not something which is rather just abstract in the pursuit of just speaking uh, what you truly believe in and uh, well, you know, before we also go into narrating these tales, which does not soothe everybody's ears, and you know, sometimes when we talk in pursuit of reason, it's very much out of the case when we really want to talk about philosophy at its own discourse. Uh, but yeah, going back to word, uh, you know, introducing Bob himself. Uh, so Bob is a devout Christian evangel uh, who has challenged various speakers at the Speakers Corner at Hyde Park in London. Uh, this is the same place which was frequented by Karl Marx, Lenin. Uh, Parent Soho and so on. He has debated Muhammad Hijab, the Dawa team, uh, the ethno-nationalist, anti-fascist, Modin, Vini, and many more atheists, agnostics, and so on. Bob in the past had been under great scrutiny for spreading hate speech and Islamophobia, but his arguments remain faithful to the Christian doctrines, uh, challenging the Muslims at an intellectual, lit and literally, and a scriptural level. Bob's concerns against Islam contend from the notions of Sharia law creeping into the legal system as blasphemy laws and a lot of people have used Islam as a political weapon to align with a certain ideologue. Bob's arguments were pertaining to Christian values and intellectualism that has been part of the country for centuries. Uh, he has remained faithful to this path of peace and evangelism even in the cases of dire physical attacks. It is indeed an honour to be having you for the guest lecture today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We're not rich enough to have two microphones. <laughs> um, so guys, thank you very much for taking uh, time out of your evening to hear my mumblings and uh, ramblings on, on different things. Uh, and thank you Ritzy so much for inviting us here. Um, I'm not sure what perspective uh, people have come with or, or what kind of views people have come with. The aim of today's talk is essentially to talk about um, Nietzsche's philosophy and particularly uh, his understanding of the death of God uh, and the implications that that has for things like truth and values and, and moral systems. And then to uh, talk about Christian ontology, because obviously Nietzsche was a great critic of um, Christianity. Um, so without further ado, I just want to start with uh, a small word of prayer, as we are Christians. I am a Christian, so that is what we do. Uh, if you're a Christian, you're more than welcome uh, to join me in, in following this prayer in your own heart uh, and joining me in the Amen afterwards. So, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, um, I have the impression that some of you think, or some of you may be under the impression, that I'm some kind of Islamophobe, or that I'm some kind of alt-right speaker, or some right-wing speaker. I want to correct you on all three of those things, I am none of them. I simply see myself as someone who is a disciple of Christ, and I try to follow Christ as best as I can. And where that makes me land on the political spectrum, I don't particularly care. So if on some issues I'm considered extreme right, so be it. If on some issues I'm 
in the center of politics, so be it. And if on some issues I'm in the left of politics, so be it. I don't really care for a coherent left right wing understanding of politics, rather a Christian one. However, that obviously has uh, a basis on our understanding of what truth is and what right and wrong is and what values are and so on and so forth. So, if you take the view of Nietzsche that these things are fundamentally questionable, that they're the constructs of history and that really we have to build them ourselves, then the idea of a coherent meta-narrative falls down into something much more subjective and individualistic. Um, I, I should confess I'm not a philosopher. I did do philosophy in my first year of uni, but it wasn't something that I specialised in. I specialised in religious studies. And so my talk will have a religious studies angle to the topic. Obviously, it's not my field, so, um, you know, bear with me as I, as I delve into a field that is not my natural habitat, but then try to bring in the learning that I have as a religious studies student to that. So, just to start off with, just to kind of summarise, to get a feel of what we're talking about, we, we just need to hear the words that Nietzsche put into the madman. I'm sure many of you who are familiar with Nietzsche know about his madman who declared the death of God. Um, and this will give us a feel of what we're about to go into. The madman said, Do we still hear nothing of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we still smell nothing of the divine decom decomposition? Gods too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How can we console ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? The holiest and the mightiest thing the world has ever possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water could we clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what holy games will we have to invent for ourselves? Is the magnitude of this deed not too great for us? Do we not ourselves have to become gods merely to appear worthy of it? Now, for those of you who are looking for some kind of brief background into Nietzsche as a philosopher, I'd encourage you to buy a book. That's not what I'm here to do. Um, I want to look at his, his works and his thoughts. Um, so, but I do want to comment a little bit about his style. He completed four, 14 major works that have been translated into English that I'm aware of. Uh, one completed after his formal career came to an end, um, and there were countless other letters and essays. His writing was satirical, chaotic, poetic, with extended use of parables and pictorial metaphors. However, due to ill health, his style had to be aphoristic, with the use of short prose leaping from idea to idea, sometimes with no obvious connection. Nietzsche, whilst rejecting faith, remained at least at the level of temperament deeply religious. In many ways, when one is familiar with the life of Nietzsche and his philosophy, it seems to marry up well with his own personal journey through life, as he wrestled with his own desires, his own failures to meet those desires, and to make sense of his own suffering without belief in God, the God of his fathers. Nietzsche said, he who climbs upon the highest mountain laughs at all tragedies, real or imaginary. And in The Birth of Tragedy, and the full title is The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music, which he wrote in 1872, the aim was at finding out what made the Greeks great. He argued that we'd viewed the Greeks through a cultural lens, an Apollonian, an Apollonian lens. This was meant we have missed the Dionysian aspect of their culture. The Greeks balanced both the rational and the exuberance of life in art, where the Dionysian and the Apollonian met. Without both, we kill culture and cannot create great art. The celebration of tragedy is the means to cultural greatness. Nietzsche saw European civilization as dying, and he saw it dying at a cultural level, it had become decadent. And what he sought was a way to revive the cultural greatness of Europe and to understand why it was dying. He wanted to get to the truth, 
that lay behind the myth of Dionysius. Does anyone know who Dionysius is? No? Yeah, I see some people saying yes, some people saying no. So Dionysius, um, he saw, or the spirit of Dionysius, he saw as a way of restoring the heroism needed to meet the, degen the degeneration of culture. Dionysius was a sickly half-breed son of Zeus and Semele, who sent all those who cared for him mad, such as the Mayanites, to the point where they would exult in the tearing of flesh, both of their own and of others. He was the god of madness, savagery, wine, parties, and ecstasy. That's the emotional state, not the drug, just to be clear. Um, this madness, this surrendering to desire, is the source of creative energy to be tapped into. We need to ele elevate the Dionysian spirit, he argued, to counter the over-rationalized culture of our age. So he saw within this kind of Dionysian spirit, this abundance of life, a way to create or to recapture a creative spirit that would exalt the creative arts to produce great works. And so at the beginning of his career, um, Nietzsche was a huge fan of Wagner, Wagner, sorry, uh, and the music that Wagner was making. And he saw an opportunity with Wagner, and Wagner himself at the beginning of his career saw himself as recasting uh, the culture and reconnecting culture to a lost greatness. If that this move to rationality was a result of the negative influence of Socrates. The Socratic search for knowledge, he believed, was untenable. A relativist, he believed people and civilizations can only bear the knowledge that allows them to function, after which they can self-destruct. This is exactly what he believed happened to Christendom. With its, genuine, sorry, with its genuine pursuit of truth, it discovered the truths that made it collapse. So as because Christian civilization was committed to the discovery of truth, Nietzsche argued that through the discoveries of science, Darwinianism, uh, the emergent psych studies of psychology, that, that European civilization had discovered all of those truths, all of those realities that would ultimately lead to the collapse of uh, Christian civilization. So Greek culture was a culture that was able to celebrate. Uh, they would have many kind of festivals where they would have a very carnal celebrations. And the closest thing to try and help you picture it um, that we have in our very modern post-Christian society are things like Mardi Gras and the Notting Hill Festival. Has anyone been to either of those? Yeah. Now, the Greeks would get with all of that, they would be fine with all of that, they would just ask the question, where's the orgies? Um, and that's seriously how most Greek festivals would end. Um, and actually, when I was looking, when this was originally going to be at the university, I was looking at the three kind of things. I was looking for things that um, would be interesting to students in a lecture. And the things that came up were to talk about sex, to talk about the end times, and then I thought to myself, so I could do a talk on sex in the end times, and that would interest people. But um, there was no way that I could sort of barrel that into uh, a talk on Nietzsche's philosophy. Nietzsche saw Christian asceticism as the antipode to his philosophy. The denial of the self and its desires was the very opposite of what he came to understand um, life and its meaning to be about. In Genealogy of Morals, uh, he wrote, uh, he wanted to tell the story of how morali uh, morality as a means, uh, sorry, let me start that again. In the Genealogy of Morals, he wanted to tell the history of morality as a means of deconstructing moral systems. Moralities, he argued, have histories and those, those histories can be traced. Since moralities have histories, they are not fixed or given and therefore evolve, and thus, we cannot speak correctly of right and wrong moralities. He believed that Christian morality could be traced to the weak and the dispossessed, the Jewish nation, which had been slaves for huge parts of their history. 
in Egypt, in Persia, and in Babylon. The Jewish people had been dominated and subjugated, and thus they had inverted moral the morality of the strong to create a morality of the weak, turning necessity into virtue. So that would be because I cannot, um, because I cannot have power, I will cherish humility. Because I cannot have sex with whom I wish, I will cherish chastity. And so the Jewish nation was making a virtue of the, uh, the situation that they found themselves in. Now, he, he, Nietzsche placed it on the Jewish nation. However, many of the things that he placed on the Jewish nation, I think many Jews would find strange um, as not particularly being a fair reflection of Judaism. And as a religious studies student, I would share that criticism. They're more properly a criticism of something that as a religious studies student we would call civic religion or the Christian form of civic religion. However, so Christian morality is the meek articulating a morality to fit their reality. Moralities fit the circumstances of the people that believe them. So it is not bad that slaves come up with a slave morality. They need it to sustain them through their hardships. Nietzsche believed that to know the origin of the thing was to know its quality. Thus, since Christian values came from a Jewish worldview, which was rooted in a slavish history, therefore, these were the values good for only the followers, the herd, not the overcomer, not the superman. The denial of our nature, with all of its wants and desires, builds up a poison within the culture that would eventually kill it. And it was exactly this thing that Nietzsche believed was killing European civilization. That Europeans were denying their natures, denying their desires, denying their wants, their envies, their lusts, their, their will to power. The Dionysian needs release, he believed. Suffering is not, in and of itself, bad, but only suffering that lacks a meaning. Suffering is human, and so therefore, to suffer is to be human. As a result, all suffering of its own is neutral. A person must find themselves before their sense of self is consumed by the herd mentality. So we live in a, 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 a civilization in which the vast majority of people are what Nietzsche would describe as the herd. And this is always at risk of consuming our sense of self before we discover any greatness or any possibility of greatness within us and making us conform only to the, the basis of the herd's morality. A person to know themselves truly and honestly, without distortion, having a measure of themselves that is real, that has a close or as close a match to reality as possible. This conception Nietzsche took straight from the Greeks and it's called zoprasne. Now that's the idea that you know yourself truly. If you're ugly, you can look yourself in the mirror and you say to yourself, I'm ugly. If you're, if you're not a good public speaker, and you can look at yourself and say, I'm not a good public speaker. You have a genuine assessment of yourself that is not given to any self-delusion, that is not given to any kind of escapism or any kind of self-justification, but is a realistic appreciation of yourself for all of its strengths and its weaknesses. And knowing your own weaknesses in Nietzsche's world wasn't considered a bad thing. It wasn't considered a bad thing in the Greeks world. In fact, it was considered a, a sign of a true man to truly know yourself. I think we've all seen it on um, those kind of programs that appear, um, what they're called, I don't, don't, don't watch them, where they come and they try to sing and then people will, what's one of them? X Factor, thank you. I don't watch, as you can imagine, I don't watch them very much. Um, but those kind of programs, and then you see these characters, who obviously the producers have let through on purpose, who have a very deluded understanding of their own ability to sing, 
Well, that's not suppressing. So prasne would be that the singer acknowledges that they can't sing and they stop singing rather than saying that they're going to continue singing because the judges have just got it wrong. Philosophy, sorry, my apologies. Your sense of humor, right, let's just go back. So prasne. The truth when your reality and your sense of yourself align is what is truth. The reality is that most people of his time did not want to follow Christian morality. So they were not in a state of suppressing. Because they would say to themselves, I want to be a Christian. But in their heart of hearts, they didn't. They didn't want to follow Christian teaching. And so their, their Christianity was only outward. Whilst inside, they were filled with ravenous desires that they were constantly concealing or suppressing. So Christian morality was not something that was followed, but only appeared to do so as a shadow of uh, a surface level. Thus, the people were living in contradiction to their true selves. The philosophy being expounded was highly individualized philosophy. It cared little in how to guide societies, culture, or governments. And that's very important when you hear people um, link uh, Nietzsche's philosophy to the Nazis, which is something that he never had a part of and he would have rejected completely. His, his philosophy was for the individual uh, and he really didn't say much about how you would apply this as a societal level. In fact, he was deeply suspicious of society and he saw um, the kind of person that he was writing to as someone who would be able to rise above society itself. These thoughts, which he concluded in his last work, Eke Homo, um, the inner man is formed by culture, which itself is formed by history. Thus, by knowing the past, we can know ourselves more clearly. Without a grounding in history, we will simply pursue novelty and entertainment. The Dionysian beast, the Dionysian beast that still lays within us with all its destructive, creative energy should be harnessed and its power and energy released so that it would begin to create and mold the world around it. And we lose that if we allow ourselves to follow a morality of a herd. And we lose that if we allow ourselves to simply be entertained rather than to seek to excel. His biggest work was uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which he wrote between 1883 and 1895. He wrote it in three books, and the first he completed in just 10 days. Um, he was someone who was very dedicated to his work. He just saw himself as writing the Bible of the future. Ironically, one of the central messages of the book was not to follow Nietzsche, but to be your own man and to follow yourself, to be full of yourself in every way without restraint. The aim was to liberate the self and overcome the restraints to full self-realization and becoming. This was a philosophy for the individual, not for the society at large. Nietzsche said, one repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil. So Nietzsche's ultimate lesson is don't follow Nietzsche. His ultimate lesson is discover your own truth and then follow it. There's an obvious paradox there, and I'm sure you're all bright enough to see it. Um, his philosophy was wholly of this world and for this world, with no time for false promises of another. It was a religion, all of his concepts, all of his ideas, and all that living out of his ideas were to be done in the here and now for the rewards of the here and now, if you were lucky enough to get them. There was no sense that there would be any sort of recompense in another world. In fact, as we'll see, he didn't believe that there was any other world. There was this one, and that's it. This life, and that's all. Your envy indicated to you who you are not, but it also indicated to you 
what you can become. So embrace your enemy and let it be your guide. We are all to be Zarathustras. Zarathustra is speaking to the future Superman. Because Zarathustra was the first Superman. And I think very much Zarathustra was Nietzsche and how Nietzsche understood himself. He was the first Superman before his time speaking to the future of which he was its first echo. You look up when you wish to be exalted and I look down because I am exalted, wrote Nietzsche. We have killed God and cannot undo the damage done. He saw this both as a terrible reality and as an amazing opportunity for man to take a new direction. Since God does not exist, he is not the grounding of all being and the basis of all that is true and false in morality and virtue. Resultantly, such things have no significance apart from what we give them. So essentially what he's saying is, because up to this point in European thinking, the understanding of the divine was the basis of all things. And probably about a hundred years before, in Nietzsche's view, society had long since stopped acting as if that was true, but still paid it lip service in every possible way. And Nietzsche was saying, well, no, God is dead. What now? What do we do now that there is no basis for truth, as we have previously understood it? What do we do now that there is no basis for values, as we previously understood it? What do we do now that there is no basis for morality, as we previously understood it? The death of God leaves the culture in danger of falling into nihilism. Nietzsche was trying to face up to this reality, head on, without flinching, and embracing all of its horror and all of its opportunity. He wished to use both art and philosophy to give life meaning that it had otherwise now lost. He was in a way replying to Schopenhauer, who before Nietzsche had also concluded that God is dead. But he had come to the conclusion that because God is dead, life had no meaning and so pain and suffering were meaningless. Thus, it's better not to be alive. So, if you can imagine that all of those soldiers that fought in World War I and fought in World War II had died for nothing, that all the kind of things that you put yourself through to achieve some goal is all meaningless, that it is based upon nothing, that your sense of, well, I'm doing this for the good, is just language that has no root in anything. The death of God takes away all the structures by which we start to measure the value of one thing or another. Why, for instance, are you all sat here listening to a guy who goes under the pseudonym of a cartoon character, as opposed to sitting at home and playing on a PlayStation. You see, if God is dead and life has no meaning, then these two actions are of equal value. In fact, neither of them has any value at all. And you might as well do that, which is just, well, whatever you feel like. Your whim at that moment, at that time, how do you rationalize the basis of your life? How do you structure the, the picking up the five pound note and giving it to the old lady who dropped it out of her purse is the right thing to do rather than just picking up the five pound note and putting it in your own pocket? On what basis can you say one of these actions is right and the other one is wrong? Schopenhauer said, there is no meaning to any of this. And all that suffering you're going through is totally meaningless. The cancer that has stricken you down, meaningless. The miscarriage you had, meaningless. The fact that you got attacked, meaningless, robbed, meaningless. 
It's all meaningless. And Schopenhauer said, if that's the reality, then surely death is better than life. And Nietzsche understood the value of that critique that yes, God is dead, and so life actually has no meaning. But what he disagreed with was the conclusion that since God is dead and life has no meaning, we might as well prefer to be dead. He said, well, actually, we can exalt a meaning out of ourselves, that we can construct meaning individually through an assertion of our own will and ability. And that was the, the exercise that Nietzsche was constructing, that he was going into. Nietzsche argued that we could construct meaning for life and thus not suffer in vain, to live for some aim that would make all suffering a price worth paying. When one overcomes his fears and affirms the whole of himself, despite all other things, he has overcome. He has become the Ubermensch. Thus, he affirms your desires, your wants, and he says, pursue them. Find your own good and evil by placing your will above your better self, above the slide into meaninglessness that existence constantly is threatened by, the void that we are simply floating over. He devised a meditation called the eternal reoccurrence to help you to discover if you had become this kind of person that could affirm life in all of its suffering, in all of its ecstasy, in all of its joys, and all of its pleasures. And the idea of the eternal reoccurrence was the idea that you could, oh, you're right, Jason. Yeah, is that you could, if you could relive your life exactly as it is, without anything ever changing, again and again and again, ad infinitum. If you could say yes to doing that, then you have affirmed life. If you couldn't say yes to doing that, then you have not yet affirmed life and you are one of the preachers of death. The challenge that Nietzsche is laying down to you is to assert a meaning to your own life and to pursue it no matter what it costs you, no matter how much you have to suffer in its pursuit. And if by doing that, you have the kind of life that you would be willing to live again and 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 so on and so forth, then you have reached the highest pinnacle of human being, the highest possible ontology. This he called Amor Fati, to love your fate. To love one's fate in spite of its suffering. To see if one had achieved the pinnacle of ontology, which is the cardinal to a new epoch of human endeavour. His criticism of Christianity was more of the values of civic Christianity of his own time than of real Christianity, but of the Christianity that you would find described in the New Testament, or even recognise in the Renaissance. Because the thing about the Renaissance is that it started in northern Italy as refugees fleeing Islamic occupation and invasion of Byzantium, um, Asia Minor, brought with them Greek learning that had once been lost to Europe. And as this new learning or this rediscovery of ancient learning impacted European culture, it stimulated thought in all different kinds of ways and it stimulated the culture in all different kinds of ways. And Christians at that time their equivalents of the millionaires and the billionaires would use their money to sponsor scholars, to sponsor um, natural philosophers, which were their, their equivalent of scientists, in a way of elevating the whole of society. And what I find interesting 
is that in some ways the very thing that Nietzsche is sort of pointing towards in terms of the individual, there was actually a societal response back in the Renaissance predating Nietzsche. The, the whole of society at the, the Renaissance kind of did something like what Nietzsche was calling them to, where people used their skills and their abilities to elevate the whole of society. And that's why when you go to Italy, you see all these public buildings that are far from functional, but they're absolutely breathtaking. Because the idea was that beauty would elevate the whole of humanity. And that the use of beauty would elevate the spirit of everyone, whether they were the beggar on the street or the bishop. Something that we've long since lost in, in our architecture. And you could argue in a lot of our art. He doesn't read like someone who's attacking Christ, but Christianity of his own time. Christianity is what Nietzsche would describe a true world theory, which allows the mind to escape nihilism and make sense of suffering. And a true world theory, all true world theories, were based on the idea that there was some future destination in another life or in another period of history that would make all the current suffering that you're going through worth bearing. This true world was and is the realm of higher value, as this world was the realm of lower value and thus less overall value in comparison to the next life. Thus, by giving man self-esteem and meaning to suffering. True world theories prevent nihilism. However, nihilism will emerge when we realise that this is just a fantasy. Do you all follow that? Yeah? I hear one, see one person nodding, see a lot of people blank faces. Yeah? I'm sorry, it's very dense. Um, okay. So the idea is that there's a future world and we can get to it. And by getting to it, it makes whatever we're enduring in this world better. And he's saying that that is a fiction, and once we realize that it's a fiction, nihilism becomes inevitable. Nietzsche describes three types of true world theory. One was the temporal, based in this world, but into which a future transformation was hoped for. And an example of this would be Marxism. Marxism says, that in some future Marxist state, the Marxist man will emerge, a new kind of man. And to achieve that future state, that future Marxist state, it justifies revolution and all the sufferings that would come with revolution and class conflict in this world. So that would be an example of a temporal um, true world theory. Another one would be the monistic, and that's the idea that the self is simply illusory and that actually we are one with the origin of the universe. And an example of this would be Hinduism. The idea that actually we're all Brahman, we're all on, we're all the, con the great consciousness and that actually we have lost ourselves at some level. So, the third one is the eternal, which is the idea that there is some eternal and changing state that can be accessed after death, such as Platonic philosophy, with the idea of the eternal soul entering the realm of forms after death. The death of God is the collapse of these paradigms, which will push man towards nihilism, as now, sorry, as how then shall we make sense of our suffering? However, this collapse presents us with the opportunity to reimagine the horizon human values, meaning and morals, and to paint it again in vivid colours. Nietzsche believed that the collapse of the true world theory is because, is because we've proved why the belief in God became necessary, not that we have some new powerful proof of his non-existence. Faith, therefore, is the fulfilment of deep psychological needs. Nietzsche was trying to live a good life in the absence of God by making the most of this life. Truth is relative and can be created 
by the creative affirmation of life's activity. Nietzsche conceded that a true world may yet actually exist, but believed that there was no way to actually know. So he was agnostic. He wanted a man to stand on his own two feet. He saw the cognitive dissonance of denying Christian narratives whilst trying to maintain Christian values and wanted to wipe the slate clean, to give culture a tabula rasa. He was therefore attacking all European culture, not just Christianity, of his own time, including the self-contradictory secular ideologies that upheld that all people were equal whilst denying the Christian narrative that had given this value meaning and birth. Secular values of the Enlightenment philosophy were trying, for instance, to create generalities of practice from particular principles, such as Kant's categorical imperative, and he dismissed all such things. Morality should emerge from within you, from your affirmation of life. Truth is subject to that impulse. What does not affirm your life, therefore, cannot be held to be true by you. He saw himself as writing for a man not yet born, a future man who would arrive later. Nietzsche said, the higher we saw, the smaller we appear to those who cannot fly. He saw pity as a societal value, abhorrent. Values needed to emerge from within the self and not be adopted because of societal norms. So in other words, if you pity someone because society tells you that that is the right thing to do, Nietzsche said you are a pitiable human being. You should decide to pity someone because you are strong and therefore you can have pity on the weak because you have decided that that is the right thing to do. Though of course, the herd, because remember Nietzsche is speaking for individuals and he's only speaking for an elect set of individuals, not for the general mass of humanity. He believed that his philosophy was beyond the reach of most people. Probably everyone in this room, beyond the reach of us all. He's speaking to some future man. The herd, however, us, as peasants, as commoners, we still need herd moralities because those herd moralities allow us to function. And we need them because we're not strong enough to do otherwise. His philosophy was contemptuous of democracy or the idea of human equality. He believed that the Ubermensch needed to be a law unto himself. However, if the Ubermensch should over his own weakness, should overcome his own weakness, then he should surely be able to overcome the weaknesses in others as well as pity the incurably weak. Pain should be the result of striving to some greater cause, and as a result, has both meaning and even, therefore, value. So if you're suffering because you're trying to achieve something great, then your suffering is not in vain. Mankind, he believed, was in danger of regressing into the last man, because of the death of God. A man who would look at all the majesty and wonder of the cosmos and merely blink. Unable to be inspired to great work or achievement in art or in anything else by the wonder that he saw around him. And instead, only pursuing his own life of comfort and pleasure, taking interests in trinkets and hobbies that contribute nothing to the advancement of mankind, such as photographing what you eat and putting it on Twitter, or looking at videos of kittens on YouTube, or collecting stamps, or train spotting, or going to the nightclub, getting absolutely wasted, just so you can wake up and say that I remembered nothing about last night. What did I do? All of these kinds of behaviours, Nietzsche understands to be the last man. 
the man that is inspired by nothing and achieves nothing great. Anyone hear an echo of our current world in that? Man, Nietzsche said, should live dangerously. So build your house on the edge of a cliff. Go and live at the side of a volcano. This kind of danger would force him to a creative excellence. He believed that the herd mentality that would emerge in a nihilistic culture would lead to a mediocrity and could potentially swamp the emergence of the superman because the herds hate the idea of the radical individual, thus they call it evil. And that kind of herd mentality is the kind of thing we see when people are being protested because they have ideas that go against social norms. That's the herd mentality right there. You're evil because you're saying something that the rest of society does not say. Therefore, you're bad. We see that in our society all the time. They're called anti-fascista. Examples of the Superman are Napoleon, Voltaire, Julius Caesar, but the closest was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. The Superman would be wicked around sex. He would be selfish, he would be hurtful if necessary, but would not resent the success in others. He would be gentle to the incurably weak and would be driven by a desire to raise the whole of his society through some contribution to culture that was aimed at greatness. Nietzsche's challenge to us is what then is your greatest possible ambition? And that is a question that Nietzsche poses to each of us as individuals. What is your greatest possible ambition? And what are you willing to sacrifice to get there? Now every single one of you will come up with a different answer. And every one of those answers may predicate that you do something that prevents the other people achieving their greatest ambition. And that is the will to power. That is your ability to make sure that you win and others lose. None of this dem democracy, none of this equality, you stamp on that person to get where you need to be. Because your greatness, your greatest ambition, needs to be fulfilled. This is not something that we can collectively work together on. Because that doesn't make you a superman, it makes you a herd. Cooperation is something that is a tool. Nietzsche wrote, the real man wants two different things, danger and play. Therefore, he wants woman as the most dangerous plaything. Those were Nietzsche's words, not mine. So, in Twilight of the Idols, one of his last works, Nietzsche wrote that man should be the Aegon. The Aegon is a Greek concept of one who competes or struggles. So as to triumph in life in a cause. Well, that cause is a choice, your choice. You should struggle in your chosen endeavor. Even if you fail, you should struggle. You should try and compete to test yourself, as what you achieve is the measure of yourself, of your capacity as a man. He did right for men. His views were of his time, but we can put that into modern language, man and woman. But by doing that, we've immediately changed Nietzsche's thought to fit our equality agenda, which he didn't have. He would be described as a misogynist. Um, striving can sometimes produce agony, but the struggle is essential to prevent man from falling into a herd mentality, becoming the mass of unthinking, unconscious, undriven slaves that seek only comfort and pleasure. The suffering you endure is creative and produces the creative spirit. 
by pursuing pleasure and avoiding suffering, we lose this creative spirit. Those that taught escapism, the comfort seeking, or the Christian aesthetic, were preachers of death because they denied life. Now, Nietzsche was a great thinker, um, and many of the kind of things that he wrote about were quite prophetic, I think. I think he predicted a lot, but just to show how pre prophetic he was, how much foresight he saw, how, how deeply he saw into the movements of our culture, Nietzsche predicted not only the rise of the Third Reich, but he also predicted the Holocaust something he found abhorrent. But he saw it coming, and he writes about it, because he saw the direction that culture was moving in. Now the mentality of man prevents the capacity for great art. The people, he, 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 sorry, my apologies, he predicted that people will care more for an abstract concept of humanity than they will for the people in front of them. He was staunchly against the use of alcohol as it numbs the pain of life. His writings influenced the likes of Alfred Adler, Freud and Carl Jung and were anti-Darwinian in that he saw man's capacity to regress. His work should be understood as a psychological evaluation of values, as he wrote in Eke Homo and understood himself as a psychologist plumbing the depths of the human mind, a pursuit he considered beyond the reaches of the common man. He saw such people as being afraid to face up to the full reality of their wants and desires, and therefore they don't dig much deeper than a surface evaluation of themselves. The human psyche he understood to be complicated and multi-layered, hard to navigate, and was unnegotiable except for the most exceptional or explorer. He stated in the dawn of morning that one could go mad by doing so, as we are a bundle of contradictions at variance with ourselves, and thus we have to discipline the inner self to bring order to, the, to this inner chaos. And we did this through what he called the organizing principle, to bring all these desires to order by training all these other desires towards a heroic goal, which will then emerge, sorry, my apologies, that we were training all these other desires and through doing so, a heroic goal would emerge that we can thrust ourselves towards. Such attempts are confused by social moralities. Thus we can only become what we have the psychic material to become. And that's why most of us can't be the Ubermensch, because we just don't have it in us. We don't have it emotionally, we don't have it in strength of will, we don't have it as a capacity to become the Ubermensch. His writings eventually came to influence the National Socialist Movement, but that was never his aim. And as such, because his, his philosophy was never aimed at social application. It can be argued, however, that since Nietzsche himself had described Napoleon as an example of the Ubermensch, he couldn't argue against the idea that Hitler was as well. So, some criticisms, and then we'll, we'll stop because we've, we've gone through a lot. Um, Nietzsche understood truth to be relative, but he states that as a statement of reality, which means that he's making a truth statement. Dr. William Lane Craig said, we should also be skeptical of Nietzsche's denial of truth and Nietzsche's perspectivism. Nietzsche's denial of truth self-refutes, directly and indirectly. When Nietzsche says truth is mere metaphor or illusion, then his claim which he purports to be true, is also mere metaphor or illusion. In other words, not true. If truth is not mere metaphor or illusion, then Nietzsche's claim is false. Either way, 
Nietzsche's denial of truth is guilty of a direct self-refuting contradiction. Nietzsche uses values to structure a value system without any good reason. Why, for instance, does he encourage us to love our life, amor fati? Why love your fate? Why? Why, why not hate your fate? Why does he choose love as opposed to hate? Why does he choose individual over herd? If these values have no intrinsic meaning and his attempt to rewrite all values, why make choices in the way that he has done? He's obviously working to a set of unacknowledged um, predicates. These are reactions and subjective judgments, in my opinion. Why use a love and measure of anything? Why not by how much you hate weakness? Or despise the herd? Why must it be about your life rather than the contempt for other people's lives? You see, Nietzsche is using a value system, he can't escape it. It is intrinsic to the human nature and despite his best efforts, he still ends up using a superstructure, a language that decries a moral system, even whilst he's trying to rewrite the moral system. The idea of the eternal reoccurrence is also flawed, because the idea of the eternal recurrence is you can assert and wish to repeat life over and over again despite what you suffer, because there's something in that life that makes all that suffering worthwhile. So what do you do with the Paris Hiltons of this world? People who've never had to suffer a day in their life and would gladly relive it over again and again and again and again and again without contributing anything of value. Sorry, Paris. What do you do with those? They don't fit into the eternal reoccurrence. The eternal reoccurrence is built on the idea of making the suffering of your life meaningful. So there are criticisms of Nietzsche. Before I move on to my second part of the talk, I think it's important that everyone has just a few minutes. Talk to your neighbour, just take a, just discuss what was the main thing that sort of resonated with you, that stuck in your head, the impression, uh, a particular aspect of Nietzsche's teaching, just to refresh your mind before I move on to the next section. Um, what I want to talk about now is, is Christian ontology. And I'm going to try and do this by pulling out biblical motifs, biblical pictures that we see in the New Testament, um, and then present them to you almost like an ode to Nietzsche in an aphoristic style. So this is my own personal ode to Nietzsche. Um, and I hope you will be patient with me, because that means a lot of ad-lib. Okay? Um, the list that I'm going to go through is not complete. And considering that I've probably got about 15 minutes, Ritzy, before we go into questions, sure. yeah, um, you'll just cut me off. Yeah, you could go for it, I think. You, you, you can you just cut me off. Okay. You can just cut me off. Um, so let's let's go. Let's start from the bottom actually, and work our way to the top. Um, yeah, so we, we, I'm going to discuss Christian ontology. I'm guessing everyone knows what I mean by ontology. Here's a nod. Do I need to explain ontology? You're all there. Yes. Those of you that don't, ontology just means being. It just means the thing you are. Yeah? So we're going to look at the Christian pictures of what it, the, the pictures of the Bible, the pictures of the New Testament, of what it means to be a Christian human, or how to be a human being as a Christian. Okay? And I'm going to do this um, as, a, as an ode to Nietzsche in, in a particular style. So Christian is faithful slave, Matthew 25, 21. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
A Christian therefore fulfills his duty whether the responsibility is large or small, pleasant or painful. A Christian is indifferent to all the casualties and accidents of life. His aim is to do his master's will. He is not to serve other masters, no other gods. He is not to serve money, not to serve nation state. He is not to serve philosophy or the pursuit of truth. He is not to serve his self-ego. He is not to serve other religions or other political systems. He is to use his talents for the work of his master. What skills he has, what abilities he has, he lays them before his master's feet and says, how do you will that I use this? If I'm an accountant, I will use it to do the accounts of the church. And if I'm a doctor, then I will use it to make the, the body of the church well. And if I'm a soldier, I will use my skills to defend the church. And if I'm a politician, I will use my skills to um, express the will of the church in politics. A Christian is a faithful slave. A Christian is an alert slave. Luke 12, 37. The servants who are ready and waiting for this return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will seek them. Put on an apron and serve them as they sit and eat. The Christian way of being is to be attentive to the master's voice. We Christians believe that we are looking for that vocation that God has given us to walk in this life. And when we find it, we walk it wherever it leads. If that leads us to prison, so be it. If that leads us to the, the doors of number 10, so be it. If it leads us to being a pauper on the street, so be it. If it leads us to being a, a brilliant actor or stars in Hollywood movies, so be it. We find our vocation and we follow it. We await our master's return with eagerness. Christians are expectant that Christ will return. We live in that hope daily, in the hope that today will truly be our last day on earth, that today is the Lord's day and we will rejoice and be glad in it. He will reward us, his faithful and other servants. Our God is a God who will actually bless us, who will, as it were, save us and serve us. Our God is not a God who is distant and far away, but imminent and present to the realities that we face. Christian, as a tree bearing good fruit, Matthew 7, 17. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A Christian is to walk in good works. Good works are things like feeding the hungry, clothing the destitute, giving drink to the thirsty. It's about um, giving good counsel to the doubting, to correct sinners. It's about um, seeking that good for others that we would want for ourselves. To live a life straight forward in practical compassion, in response to the suffering of others around us. It isn't about philosophizing what is the cause of suffering and how do we escape it as the Buddha did. It's saying that here is suffering in front of me. What should be my response? And my response is always to love my neighbor as myself. By doing so, a Christian cultivates virtues like prudence and justice. He cultivates hope and faith. He cultivates chastity. He cultivates that kind of virtue, that kind of inner man that is filled with joy and goodness and kindness and self-control. And through it, and through that cultivation, he becomes the very image of his maker more clearly for the world around him to see. Christian as light, Matthew 5.14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Christians are to be an example of truth in contrast to falsehood. Christians are to stand for what is true no matter who is saying you're wrong. And that is why Galileo Galilei was able to argue with the Pope and say that the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. He was able to argue with the Pope because Christians are meant to stand for what we believe in good conscience is true. 
And by that standing, they illuminate the world around them by causing contrast to that which is false. They should be a means by which people begin to see reality for what it is and not for what they have been deceived into thinking that it is. Christian as nation. After this, in Revelation 7, 9, after this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Christians are a nation made up of many nations, and we can defend our rights and have our own political narrative aimed at our own political ends, separate from any other political narrative or ideology, whether that is conservatism, socialism, communism, fascism, Nazism, liberalism, Islam, all of them. We Christians have our own political agenda. Christians should pursue the interests of the people of God in every sphere and not make being Christian simply an NGO worker for the world. As a nation, Christians can form their own states. Christian as church. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The church is the gathered people of God, that collective communion of people gathered from every nations and ethnicities and tribes who are worshipping the one true God in every language. They are gathered together and as such those people can have Though whatever those people do collectively in the name of their God, in keeping with their faith, is truly also church. Thus the church can have businesses, institutions, charities, political parties, defense forces, pressure groups, media outlets, and other trappings of an organized people. Christian as a chosen people. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into the marvelous, into his marvelous light. We are a people with a history of our own distinct, uh, or of our own distinction from the nation states in which we live. We're a people with a sense of solidarity with one another apart from the rest. And we're a people that have a common inheritance, home, and shared accomplishments, failures and struggles, from which we can emerge from which can emerge new cultures. We are chosen because God has saved us, not because we have saved ourselves. We are chosen because God has decided that we will be saved, not because we have achieved it by any of our own efforts. Christians as one, and Ritzy, you'll just have to stop me when you want me to stop to do questions. Christians as one, John 17, 21. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Christians are one, and therefore all denominations are mistakes. Christians are one. And therefore, the plight of our persecuted brothers and sisters are not separate to our own plight. Christians are one, and that oneness is based upon the meta-narrative of us being disciples of Christ. Christians as forgiven, Luke 1, 77. To give to his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. That our sins are forgiven, which means that we need to learn to forgive ourselves and not simply beat ourselves up over past mistakes. Our sins are forgiven, which means that we should also be generous in forgiving those who have wronged us. Our sins have been forgiven, and therefore we have a hope of the future that our God is a God of mercy who inclines to include us in the future that he is making. Christians is born again, John 3, verse 3. Jesus answered him, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Life has begun again, so therefore your past mistakes have been wiped away. Life has begun again, therefore our goals and ambitions are now to be kingdom focused, not focused on what they were previously. Life has begun again, and as such, we belong to a new kingdom, a new people, a new nation, with a new past. Shall I continue? Be good. Well, let's go to the question. Okay. So, I have many more, but I ran out of time. So, I can tell you those later. Um, any questions? I've been told to let you go. Uh, yeah, Jacob and then Mummy. Well, when you talk about that more tomorrow, that are probably going to be. I can finish it after this oh, okay. if anyone's interested in me finishing it. What's that? Okay. Uh, so, thanks for your enlightening uh, talk. First and foremost, I would like to um, ask you about nihilism. Uh, are you mentioning the, uh, the concept of nihilism uh, in Nietzsche as equivalent to Dostoevsky's uh, devil's uh, nihilism? I'm sorry? Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky. I'm not familiar with the way that Dostoevsky. Um, but obviously, use nihilism, so I wouldn't be able to make that. Okay. And the second question is is it only a fantasy? Nihilism? No, I think Nietzsche saw it as a very real danger in that he saw, like, it depends what, in what way you mean fantasy, because the moment you start talking about nihilism, all language starts to lose its meaning, as you might imagine. So, I, I, in my reading of Nietzsche, he saw nihilism as a very real existential danger that man was about to fall into. That we, and, and I would say that we have fallen into the nihilism that Nietzsche describes. Which is this man who looks at the full majesty of the universe, blinks and then goes back to his PlayStation. You know, that, that sees achievement as getting to the end of a game. Or that feels that they've accomplished something if they have sex with multiple partners. This is, none of these things are actually accomplishments. Nietzsche was saying that this is the kind of man that would emerge unless we could find another way to give meaning to life. Because the old way, which was based upon the divine, uh, and particularly the Christian divine, was now gone. And so he was saying, now that that is gone, our danger is that we will become nihilistic, the last man. And he was, he, the, whole, uh, the whole exercise of his philosophy was to map out a way that we could avoid that fate through some exertion of our own will and our own ability. Uh, and my last question is, uh, you have really uh, predicted our comfort zone following Nietzsche. Uh, but what's the, how will you differentiate between morality, uh, which is very subjective, morality and ethics? Um, you once mentioned that morality is coming out of our, is emerging yeah. uh, from our uh, own self. That's Nietzsche, uh, that's what Nietzsche wants you to do. He wants. He wants you to discover your own good and evil. He wants you to discover your own truth and then pursue it. And pursue it no matter what it costs you. So in that sense, as you, as you, as you discover your own truth, you will construct your own morality. And then the question is, are you strong enough to live it out? And the reality is, Nietzsche believes that most of us can't do that. We haven't got the psychological resources to do that. And so most of us will remain at the level of the herd, and some of us will be the higher man, but eventually from that higher man, possibly, um, a superman can emerge. The one who truly discovers his own truth, discovers his own right and wrong, good and evil, and then follows it relentlessly to accomplish something great, and by doing that will elevate society. And I think very much Nietzsche was projecting his own exercise very profoundly into his philosophy because that's exactly how he understood what he was doing. And the last question from Christianity. It's, you said that uh, a Christian is an alert slave. How can a slave be alert? So, like, 
that, that, just to be clear, these, these motifs, these biblical motifs, they're only pictures. And, and actually, when you look, go through the entire list, you'll find that some of those pictures con conflict. But the idea is that it's describing a way of being human. And, and so as a Christian, we are to live in a state of readiness for our Lord. Um, in the way that we are attentive to try and find what God wants us to do in the present. So, for example, Ignatius of Loyola, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, talked about the spirituality of, of the here and now and finding God in the immediate, in the here and now. So, how is it our, how am I encountering God in this moment? And to be very presently minded in the way that we uh, conduct ourselves. And he has a whole series of meditations where you literally review the day to discover where you met God in the day. You know, and then reflect on how did you respond when you met God. Because God is ever present to you, but you're not always present to that fact. Thank you. Yes, I did. Yeah, um, would you say that the Christian tradition of the Almighty is, is, is the same, or how does it relate to Judaism and Islam? Because in both, I mean, Christianity evolved from the law of Moses. All, all, all these, the, the law of Moses is um, revered by Christians and um, Islamists. So, would you say they all understand the Almighty to be the same, or is there a variety, is there a variation within Christianity? That's a really good question. Um, and, and the answer is that when you look... So, for example, Arab Christians will use the, the word Allah to describe God. But when they say Allah, the God that they're imagining and picturing and worshipping is completely different from the God that a Muslim will imagine when they say Allah. The theology, it's like an egg, you know, two different contents, a lizard's egg and a chicken's egg. You know, they, 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 are, they may both look like eggs, but they're very different things on the inside. And, and I think sometimes when we have this narrative in our society of three Abrahamic faiths, that's being driven for political reasons rather than a genuine appreciation of the theology of the Quran vis-a-vis -vis the theology of the Bible. And you, you, you also mentioned the contrast between the Christian and the Jewish theology. Because the whole point of Jewish theology is it points towards a coming an event, um, the, the coming of the Messiah in the establishment of the Kingdom of God. And the, the Christians, um, the very first Christians were all Jews, and they understood that all of those promises had been fulfilled in Jesus. And so, Christianity sees itself as the fulfillment of the promises in Judaism. And so we see ourselves very much connected to um, what, what, you know, the, the God of Judaism. We don't see a sort of contrast like, uh, you know, the heretic Marcion did when he said that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two different gods. Um, yeah, uh, just... Given all of the examples of people who be Uber Mensch but bad, do you think the Uber Mensch are good? Um, I think I think because he's not he's not he's not speaking of the Uber Mensch as some metaphysical he's saying that essentially the Uber Mensch is a man who is radically individualistic, but at the same time is someone who is directed towards a great objective. There are many people in our society who are radically individualistic, but they're radically individualistic with no sense of great purpose. Okay, so, well, so the Ubermensch, yeah. so in other words, yes, I think that there are people that can be the Ubermensch, and there will be people that can be rightly described as the Ubermensch. Hmm. What, what would say uh, divide uh, your normal person from, say, uh, a serial killer? You could say a serial killer is part of the Ubermensch. Well, I mean, you see, the thing is, and this is where this is where this is where there's an inherent contradiction within Nietzsche's thought. It appears to me, 
because he saw the Ubermensch as being someone that elevates society. So he would look at, he would look at a, a, a serial killer as, as not elevating society in any great way. But, here's where the contradiction is, a serial killer who, who radically um, has decided to follow his own truth and in his own truth has decided good and evil and he's decided to kill people because of what he considers to be good and evil. That kind of follows along the path of the, the superstructure that Nietzsche lays out. But Nietzsche's telos, his, his end goal in his superstructure was towards some societal improvement that the individual would accomplish. Whereas that superstructure, as I think you've rightly identified, could lead you in all different kinds of directions. And, and that's the inherent contradiction in Nietzsche's thought, is because he was trying to wipe away all values, but he was clearly still working to a rubric of values that he didn't acknowledge. Yeah. Let's wait for any more questions. Yeah. Could you elaborate on the relationship you see between this Nietzschean problem that you sketched and, and, and Christian ontology? Uh, how are they related? Is, is, is Christianity supposed to uh, help us uh, considering that we cannot create our own values as, as the Christian thought would propose? Or? Well, I, I, would say that, I would say that Christian ontology, and it's a shame I, I didn't leave myself enough time to get through uh, the full list, but Christian ontology is both corrective to, to Nietzsche, but it is also in some ways the fulfillment of, of what Nietzsche is looking for. Um, and, and the reason that I would say that is if you look at the lives of many of the saints of the past, they would have endured terrible suffering um, and they would have accomplished many great things that have elevated society. Um, and they would have done so, like Galileo Galilei, for instance, not that he would have been considered a new image, but he would have been someone who had pursued true. He would have been someone who had pursued what he had discovered to be true, though he was working to an objective sense of truth as opposed to a subjective sense of truth. So there is a difference. But Nietzsche's philosophy is fundamentally for the individual. I don't think that human ontology really, really is individualistic. I think that human ontology is in its nature corporate. And I think that I think that that which is true is that which corresponds closest to reality. And I think that the Christian meta-narrative describes reality in the most accurate way. And it describes human ontology as being fundamentally flawed, fundamentally selfish and broken and self-interested. And then it goes from that to give us both means and reason to not be and to change that self-interest to a more selfless interest in a new direction. And so I think the ontologies that are described by Nietzsche and the ontology that emerges from the Christian faith are very different. Um, and I would put it to you that the kind of last man that Nietzsche was afraid would emerge has emerged. And that the cure to that last man isn't Nietzsche's superman, but the Christian man. It's interesting that in terms of Napoleon, sorry, when Napoleon failed, he ended up being exiled on an island. But but failure isn't the definition of the Superman. The failure, because because you can try and fail. The Argon, you know, is the one who competes. So it isn't that you succeed that defines whether you're the Superman. It's the fact that you have the balls and the iron to go for it despite everything. You know. So, you know, and by contrast, you know, Christians live by faith. Now, faith isn't believing against all the evidence. Faith is obeying despite all the consequences. So, the you lost man is a combination of the slave morality, right? Sorry? The last man is like a combination of slave morality, so as opposed to, you know, no, 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 no. Slave morality, it doesn't give birth to the last man. The thing that gives birth to the last man is nihilism, is the death of God. So the, the fact that life has lost all meaning is what gives birth to the last man. Whereas slave morality was the thing that 
was restraining the emergence of the last man. So Paul already had it. I was thinking like with the idea of the legal mention is going to fix these problems. It's all the thing about individualism and stuff. I always see that all these problems start up around to these days because it's kind of universally accepted individualism. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. Uh, like everybody just seems individualistic and that's why everyone wants to go out and love them and stuff. Yeah. I mean, but, but the, the kind of, I think Nietzsche, the, the kind of culture that we have today is more like Nietzsche's last man as opposed to Nietzsche's Ubermensch. And the idea of the Ubermensch is that it is to avoid us becoming, it, it, it isn't, sorry, let's be clear, Nietzsche isn't giving a solution to society. He is saying that, that most people cannot be the Ubermensch. And so, for the herd, for the commoner, you need slave morality. But, because God is dead and nothing has any value or meaning, we now have space for a superman to arise who will pursue his own truth, whatever it costs, and that goal that will emerge out of the self-discipline of his inner man, that, that sort of orientation, will elevate society. It's not a second coming. I think it is. It is a. It is. He sees it as a way of escaping um, nihilism. It's a way of escaping of the mediocrity of society. Is it that the structure? Yes. This the, the mediocrity of society, which is what has emerged out of what will emerge out of nihilism. That mediocrity. It needs people to escape. Because remember. Nietzsche began his journey thinking, how can we re-establish um, the, um, you know, rejuvenate culture? How can we produce great art? That, that's the way he started. That's why he was a fan of Wagner. Wagner. Um, so he, he, that, that's where he began. And that, that thread of thought still went through all of his works right to the very end. I can do more questions. If, yeah. Can I have a lot of questions? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I was just thinking, uh, to what extent you would see this notion of uh, Hagia Batali, which raises, which Sorry, is raised, uh, one of the scholars, Nietzschean scholars, Hagia Batali. Okay. He comes out with the uh, Christian response to the notion of uh, the, the God is dead, and he says it's not just the God is dead in God's conception, the man is dead because he's forgotten, uh, he's abandoned the Judeo-Christian values and the morality because no more there is. Uh, you know, this deceptive sense of, you know, deriving your sovereign uh, morality from somebody of, from the external world for that matter. So he believes that uh, it's, it's basically the idea is that it's, it's, it's no more a notion that can be pondered over because man has forgotten to uh, articulate its own morality and bring out its own morality of, of, of a sovereign. So I just wonder what you think about this. I, if I understood, if I understood the point, then I, I would be sympathetic to the idea that when, if you say that God is dead, then ultimately all of our all of our language structure and all of our conceptual structure of thinking about morals and values dies with it, and and with that dies one of the distinguishing marks of the human from the beast, and in in terms of us being able to elevate ourselves, we have to be inspired by something that is above us, something that is beautiful, something that is grand, something that, that smacks us in the face and we go, wow, and then we go away and we paint a picture, write a poem and produce a play. And, you know, or, 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 or we see that the, the poem, the picture and the play are vessels of a culture that is worth defending and so we go out and fight for it. If you say God is dead, then all of these things lose their value. And thus, we die along with God. But the whole point of the Christian message is that, that we, are, we were already dead. We were dead in our sins. And God became man to bring us to life. And he, came, he brought us to life through the triumph of the resurrection, which is not just a literal event in history, but a metaphysical reality that raises the very being of what it, the very being of humanity. 
so that humanity can then engage with reality from the divine perspective and in so doing transform himself more and more like the divine that is his creator. Okay, we well, give me open the floor for one more question. You can ask as many. I, 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 guys, I'm happy to stay here for as long as you're happy to stay here. When you're bored, we'll stop. If you're still interested, I'll just keep going until you say, shut up, Bob. Do you have any more questions? Go for it, Okay, I'm interested in why uh, God is required. Uh, I, I don't see how we don't have anything to fight for today. You can always find some. I think there are plenty of values today that we can fight for without the need to suppose God. And, and Nietzsche would have, Nietzsche's response is, on what are those values based? Uh, you could perhaps base them on um, the governments in, in which they um, uh, in which they take place, and the and then the relative. So, right, so let's just deal with that because because you're saying base it on the government, right? So, what do you do when the Nazis come to power in 1933, demolish the Weimar Republic by 1935, start persecuting the Jews by 1936, and then start a global war in 1939? Because that was based all on the government and democratic principles. Well, I mean, that's debatable. No, those are all factual historical points. Mm. Which of them would you like to debate? Uh, I could. Uh, sorry, would you like to go back again? Yeah, no, no, because you, you said we can base it upon government. Yeah. And I've just given you an example of a repulsive yeah. government. Yeah. Now, firstly, on what basis do you say it's repulsive if you're saying that the values are based upon the government? Yeah. Likewise, if your value is based upon your God, or to say that your God is well, not God. Don't answer a question with a question. Yeah, yeah. great. Answer yeah. the question and then ask a question. Yeah. You've just said we can base our values on government. Yeah. So what do you do with a government that's repulsive? If you're saying that the basis of our values is the government, yeah. So well, what do you do about it? If, if your the values of your government can suppose combating governments which go against your government. So, so all we've got is a recipe for the will to power, right? All we've got is a recipe of my gun is bigger than your gun. We've got no common language by which we can navigate and negotiate moral difference. Mm -hmm. But how does supposed God change that scenario? Well, firstly, I would say that God is not supposed God is. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean that, that's yeah, a radical yeah. different, That's a radical partition. But in that's my belief. That is, that is my belief. Yes. Um, and I would say that the difference within that fundamentally is that all of us then would have something outside of ourselves to appeal to. The problem is when you've got different gods. Yeah. Yeah. Then you get the same problem. We, you, you do get the same problem, absolutely. Um, but this, this is based upon the idea that there isn't a true god, that all gods are just constructs. Yeah. And I would argue that there is a true god and that my god is that true god. But what and makes that different? from my God is bigger than yours. Well, in the sense that my God my God would not, for instance, command me to turn you into a second class citizen on the basis of your belief. But I could say that my government wouldn't do that either. But then I could point at religions that do. And there's a difference. So you, you can you can look at the concepts of gods that different religions have and you can look at them and you can see what values they teach. Now ultimately you, you do end up in a situation, as we have done through history, where religions fight one another. You know, yeah. like like Islam and Hinduism in India. Yeah. You know, they you know, they they have had um, you know centuries worth of conflict, and and that underpins a lot of the resentment that is aimed at, towards the Muslim community in India today. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the reality is though that in term, if you see all religions as being equally valid, I can see why this is a conundrum to you. Fundamentally though as a Christian, I believe in the historical reality of the resurrection. Yeah. I believe that's a fact. Yeah. So it's not just a matter of belief. So I, I think our, our disagreement fundamentally stands from that. It, it fundamentally, it boils down to whether you believe there's a real God. Yeah. If you don't believe that there's a real God, then yes, everything just becomes reduced to sociological constructs. Yeah. And once you reduce it that way, you just end up in this giant cycle of, of debate. But I would say that intrinsic to your human nature, yeah. you have the divine image imprinted upon you. 
So when you encounter something that resonates with that divine image, it will feel true to you, it will seem true to you, it will make sense to you. When you encounter realities that go against that divine image that is imprinted against you, um, that imprinted upon you, you will turn, you, you will have some resistance to them. And thus I believe that the search for truth is not in vain and that you can actually discover the truth. Okay, yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't buy it, but that's that, fine. Com that comes from... I, I'm simply possible. giving you what I believe. I'm not, I'm not yeah, trying very to, much. not going to try and convert you into it. <laughs> I mean, you can do what? <laughs> I'm more than happy to. Yeah, you also do. Uh, I think it was a spontaneous remark. Uh, you said that, uh, as in India, Hindus and Muslims fight. Uh, I think it's a very spontaneous remark. Uh, go on. Uh, I hope it hasn't brought any uh, profound belief in your statement. Because India is a secular country, and uh, Hindus and Muslims, they don't fight. Period. There are riots, the riots are being organized by politicians and crooked politicians. So, uh, it may be a spontaneous, sporadic remark that in India uh, Hindus and Muslims fight, but in truth, and uh, in truth, India is a secular and a very peaceful country. My, my intention is not to slur India. However, there is the reality of how India and Pakistan was born, which was that, that the Muslim community decided that they wanted a nation state of their own. Uh, that's separate that really, from that, that India. Really. But I mean we, we could get into like it, I'm happy to be corrected on it. It's not it's not a hill that I need to die on. So I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. You have a question? Yeah. Can you uh, elaborate on what Nietzsche meant when um, he said that the Ubermensch raises society? Like you just said that, like um, you said, Hitler was an Ubermensch or Napoleon, but I don't see how they raised it. I can see how they changed it, but I don't see how it's like fundamentally better than today's society. Well, I mean, and, and, and obviously that's based upon the value system that you make the assessment of those people. But the point is, your assessment of those people, if they are truly the Ubermensch, is irrelevant because. And unless you're an Ubermensch, your, your value system is going to be that of the herd, and the herd finds such people to be evil by necessity. The fact is, the re one of the things that made them the Ubermensch is that they had a vision that they pursued, and they pursued it relentlessly. And in the case of Napoleon, because bearing in mind, Nietzsche died before Hitler yeah. came to power. So Nietzsche never saw Hitler. Course, yeah. I said, it was me that said, that if Nietzsche saw Napoleon as an Ubermensch, you couldn't exactly argue that Hitler, by def therefore, was not. Course, yeah. But let's look at Napoleon, because Napoleon knocked over the Ancien regimes right across Europe. He, he, he spread the religion of reason. He spread the idea of the secular state. He spread the idea of the nation state, knocking over um, the empires of, you know, Prussia and Russia and and Austria, and, and spread the idea of nation states, and we are all now living in secular nation states that idolize reason. I see. So to do the the Ubermensch. Yeah, the Ubermensch. The Ubermensch. If you succeed, because bearing in mind your measure of being an Ubermensch is not whether you succeed or not, but if you succeed, yeah. the thing that you succeed in will inevitably. Um, be transferred to the herd because the herd, by definition, follow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it's a uh, awesome. follow. Up. Yeah. Um, also, also, you said that um, Nietzsche was uh, like an anti-realist or relativist. Um, wouldn't just wouldn't this make his entire like ideology kind of his personal opinion or his like preference? Yeah, it's his own existential exercise to being an Ubermensch himself. And he said, if you remember, in Zarathustra, he says, don't follow Zarathustra. Now, Zarathustra is just a, a motif for Nietzsche. He's saying, don't follow Nietzsche. Isn't there a contradiction there? Yeah, there's a massive contradiction there. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Is 
Yeah, um, considering uh, the New Testament, um, Jesus said, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Pilate didn't want to crucify Jesus, it was the Jews that wanted him crucified. And the supposed church of Jesus was established in Rome. So there's a thing to be a bit of irony or something about this, but and many people would say that if, if you read certain Bibles, there's a note saying that uh, um, the, the false religion, the Seven Hills, is Rome. You know, I don't know if it's Henry's Bible, it's in the Chaplaincy Center. You, you look at meaning from the Revelation, and they condemn Rome. But nevertheless, that is where uh, Christianity evolved from, through Protestantism. It achieved a more rational, more Nietzschean goal in itself, through people like Calvin and Luther and others, the martyrs for the ability to read the Bible for yourself. And when Jesus said, the three or two or three people gathered together in my name, my spirit is there with them. Okay. So, so you have contradictions between those who claim to represent Christianity, who carried out the most terrible atrocities in the, in the Inquisition, etc., wars between Christians in one faction or another. So uh, the, the point is, I'm trying to make is that um, how do we reconcile the fact and what does it mean when Jesus said give to Caesar that which is Caesar? Okay, so I'll deal with the, the, the question, but I, I should just say that a lot of your reading of history is flawed. Um, you know, the, the church in Alexandria is just as old as the church in Rome, as is the one based in Damascus. Was that exactly so, no, well, the well, if I'm, Empire? If I may, if I may. So, so your, your, your reading of history is actually inaccurate. Uh, at, at many, many layers. Uh, it's a very poor reading of Christian history. history. Um, however, to address the question that you asked, Christ said, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and unto God what belongs to God. When came and asked him that question, is it right Good rabbi, is it, we, rabbi, we know that you are no respect as a person who tell us is it right to pay taxes with the Herodians. The Herodians were the party of, of Herod the Tetrarch. When Christ said, pay unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs unto God, every Jew that was around him, their mind would have gone to the Psalms where it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything upon it. If everything belongs to God, what then belongs to Caesar? And to whom then does Caesar belong? which means that nothing is outside of the purview of God's sovereignty. Sure. To what extent is uh, like a re-Christianization of Western culture uh, a proposed solution from your side of, of the cultural malaise that you described? Um, I think it's essential. I think that without a, a, a re-Christianization of European culture, and I'll be the first to say that we live in a post-Christian society, but unless there is a re-Christianization of Western culture, a reinvigoration of the roots of, of European culture, then European culture, as we have historically understood it, will simply cease to exist. And whatever replaces it, of which there are a number of contenders, it will not be anything that we who consider ourselves the inheritors of European civilization will be able to recognize. And so if we want to see the continuation of what we consider European civilization, we have to see a reinvigoration of the Christian roots of our nation, and our, our European civilization. But that can't be hijacked by nationalistic agendas, which are always the first party to try and do so. They try to mask their nationalism in Christianity and say that the two things are the same and not. Christianity, by definition, is an internationalist ideology and movement, which means that we're talking about a pan-European identity, not a nationalistic one, rooted and built upon Christian identity. And then that pan-European identity then becomes pan-global because it connects with all the Christians in Latin America, all the Christians in Ethiopia, all the Christians in India, 
all Christians in Pakistan, all Christians in Japan. So where should we expect it from in Islam? This will join us. It has to come from the church. It's not going to come from anywhere else. But we see churches closing every single day. That's correct. In every single European country. So uh, I admire optimism, but not 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 in every European country. In the West, the Eastern churches are undergoing a massive revival at the moment. You know, they, when they do their processions, entire cities come out and fall. Spent quite a lot of that uh, revival is very nationalistic and not international. And, and that is a deficiency of the narrative that's being followed. Christian, a, a revival of a Christian identity is by definition internationalist. Yeah, no, I, I just meant in, in terms of your point just now about uh, the East being, well, of people of Europe being more uh, a place for optimism about the revival of religion. Yeah. I, I, I would say it's been kind of almost a mask, like when you were saying from the mask. I, 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 I would say that the, the, the revivals that we're seeing in the East haven't, haven't fully encompassed everything that they should encompass. And until Christian, and, that, and they never can do until Christians separate themselves from the national identities that they inherit. When you stop thinking, I mean, I don't know who's a Christian in this room, so I'll just talk to whoever considers themselves a Christian. When you stop considering yourself English or German or wherever, you know, insert nationality here, and you think of yourself as Christian as opposed to English, as Christian as opposed to German, as Christian as opposed to Estonian, insert your nationality here, then the sort of internationalist identity will emerge. That just boils down to the same thing, though. Nationalism or the view the Christian. You're still pitting yourself against Muslim or other religions. Why is that wrong? Religions. Because it's always, religion is always divisive, it always separates people. I always find, I, I don't like religion very much because of that. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Um, do you divide yourself against the religious for that reason? No, I don't divide myself against religious people per se, but I don't believe that. Uh, People shouldn't. People who become Christian judge others who are not Christian. No, that's what people say about Generally, Christians. My sister is Christian. I know my sister. Yeah, I think. I think. I think. In terms of in terms of Christ's teaching, Christ said that I, I've come to bring the sword. I've come to turn father again to turn son against father, and to turn mother against daughter, and to turn brother against brother, because he who chooses um, their family above me is not worthy. Of I'd, say, Christ, I'd, rather, I'd rather say it was like get rid of nationalism, yes, but also get rid of the Christ, as well. But, know, but the, the, thing, then it's the whole thing is a one. And then yeah. you know, that's the right place to be. Right? So, but, but this, kind of, this kind of oneness has to be defined by something. And all you've done is assert the particular thing that you want us all to unite around. And I assert a different thing that I think we should all unite around. And the question is why should I give way to you? I see conflict as inevitable, and I don't see it as bad. Because in conflict, in that placing your house next to the mountain, next to the volcano, that conflict will produce the kind of saints the church requires. And those saints are the ones that will revive the culture. The reason why the church is so pathetically weak is because it follows a culture of a comfy mattress is our God rather than take up your cross and follow me. Bear in mind when Jesus said take up your cross and follow me, Christ was imaging the crucifix and the crucifix would have been an image of horror. It would have been of decaying bodies half eaten by birds with flesh dripping off corpses and Christ said take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say, take up your comfy mattress, lay down, and God will stroke your ego. Not, not but, but no, but what I'm saying is yeah, the reason, the reason why, the, no, what I am saying is the reason why the church is so weak in the West is because we've replaced the God, with, we've replaced the cross with a cushion. We all know that God would be, I mean, if you get rid of all the people, then 
nature will eat itself. You know, it's, uh, animals kill each other, you know, and we do too. I get that. So that's what. I mean, but, but, what, no but this kind of, no offense, but this kind of hippie narrative, oh, let's all just get along, rubbish. It's like, it doesn't work in reality. All you're essentially saying is, let's make everything meaningless and not get uptight about anything. And that ultimately is the last man. It's the uninspired herdman who simply stares at the universe and blinks and then goes back to playing his Xbox. Things, if they don't have meaning, if they don't have meaning, then, then we can be inspired to nothing. And you can't build civilizations through mediocrity. You have to build civilization through writing it in blood. Carry oh, with everything you said, so I didn't hear everything you said, sorry. Uh, so, well, so say the things which would drive you on towards religion, like experience of altruistic love and great art and all of these things. Yeah. You still have access to those empirically in the world, and I don't know if like denial of within a religious framework necessarily equates to having to swallow that nothing has any meaning. Just back up the point. There. Well, I think I think in terms of in, in in terms of our society, like just looking at art, for instance, and, and the move that art went from time of the academies into impressionist art and how it has continued to degenerate. I remember walking into an art gallery once and being confronted by a frame on a wall, <laughs> which was probably called an Ikea. You know, and someone called that art. That's not art. That is just someone <laughs> ripping people off and calling it art. You know, that is not the kind of thing that that inspire a society to greatness it is a ego trip and and the point is if your society is people living on petite ego trips they're only ego trips rather than in, in trying to do something that will leaven the whole because one of the ontologies one of the motifs of the christian faith is that we would be salt the idea of preserving the idea of instilling or preserving life. The idea that, that we would be yeast that leavens the whole. You know, if you if you look at, at our society and turning things, because you were essentially saying that, that things still have meaning, uh, but their meanings are, are, are of a different kind. Wait, I'm not saying they still have meaning, I'm saying they're not, they don't necessarily not still have meaning. Yeah, but that, that, that indicates something about human nature, that we're always striving for meaning. And even where meaning doesn't exist, and even where meaning doesn't exist, we will impose it. And and that to me indicates that actually we are being called to a greater meaning. That human nature indicates that there is a meaning to be discovered. But would that not undermine your point about assuming that nothing has any meaning? Sorry? About about how um, the 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 hippie rubbish nothing has any meaning. But I'm, I'm saying if things have, but I, but I'm but I'm saying I, I'm saying I'm, I'm saying that if things have meaning, they have value, and if they have value, they're worth fighting for. If you're saying that nothing is worth fighting for, then you're saying that nothing has enough value for you to stake your life on. But you're not saying that at all. Right, but, but that's the point. If you're saying let's just all get along then what you're saying is that there is nothing of such value that it's worth having an argument about. I just, I just think that God is a word, and that's it, the argument is there. God is a word, and that's it. <laughs> well, and, it's and, language, it's all based in language. It's just, God and the narrative is all in language. It's so always it, made by humans. Is, is good also just a word? Good. Yeah. Yeah, language. So if it's just a word, does good talk about anything real. It talks about certain emotions within the person to do the best thing they can. It talks about, it, it comes from emotion, language comes from emotion, so when you need to uh, communicate with someone else, the emotions are there and language is developed through an emotional connection with another person.
Let, 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 let me put it more bluntly. Was, 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 Hitler, was Hitler doing something evil when he killed six million Jews? But if it's just a word, how do you measure that it's evil? Because God, we've never seen him, and we've seen Hitler. I think, I think we're having slightly two different conversations, no, to be not. honest. No, God is like, you know, yeah, intangible. And Hitler is, he was really yeah, excited. I was just I was in I was just trying to explore because God is conceptual. That's essentially what you're saying. It's not something tangible, it's conceptual and therefore because we haven't because we haven't had any tangible evidence of his existence, he is just a word. Well, the idea of objective good is also purely conceptual. So I just wanted to see how consistent to your logic you were. Because if you're saying that good, if you would then say that good is also just conceptual, you would have, sorry, just a word, then you would have no basis upon which to say that one particular action is right and another particular well, action is wrong. Um, good, well, I know God is related to a thing, whereas good is related to uh, an emotion or a feeling of what to do. I don't and think most people would understand. It's a thing. I don't think, and I'm conscious that other people might want to come in, but I, to, my, my final point would be that I don't think that when most people use the word good, they collapse it just to, con to connect to their emotions. I think when most people use good, at the back of their mind, even if they aren't consciously aware of it, they're talking about something that is right objectively. You saw the question? Jesus said, yeah. I, when you call me good, there is only one that is good, being yeah. your mighty power created him and everything else. Yeah. In its essence, it's everything. And its power is to create house and universe the immortal soul. Yeah. As uh, was in the myth of Jesus, that he rose from the dead with his immortal soul and was seen by his disciples. I, I, I'd like to point out um, a quote from the Bible, Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Uh, the living God is the saviour of all men, and especially of believers, meaning that the Almighty uh, um, has, uh, has I I I if we consider it in this light, the Almighty has extreme compassion for all the created human species. Right. The other thing is, if my memory is correct, I think Jesus may have said, or reputed to have said, that those that are not against us are with us. I think that's in the Bible. You haven't got one, maybe have you? And you yeah, have right. concordance. But you've got concordance because you might not know that. I don't yeah, know that comes, that it comes from the, the four Gospels. I am aware of that. So I, I'm not quite sure what point you were making. But let me, 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 let me read it, sir. You don't have to be a Christian to be saved. That's right. what I'm saying, because it's in the New with, Testament. With, with, with the grace of respect, um, that, that argument is an argument, incidentally, it was an opinion of people like Irenaeus. Um, it, it is a P, uh, an opinion of um, theologies like, oh, let me just get his name, one moment. He wrote First Principles. I can't remember the first Christian theologian. Because it's going to bug me now. Okay, it'll come back to me later. Wow. One of the first Christian. There's been there's been many examples of Christians who've had this. Yeah, but that's Allow me. Allow me. Just a matter. What? Just a matter. No. They are Paul's words. Sorry. I can I? Do you mind if I can reply? Yeah. Yeah. I'm asking you to reply. Yeah. Because you understand by that. But if you want me to reply, then yeah, you can yeah. let me reply. Well, respect. you were replying. But no, you mentioned so people other than Paul, and Paul is the origin of the Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. So, if you're going to make a point, you have to let someone reply yeah, to Yeah, obviously. Point. So, my point to you is that there, there has been examples of Christian thinkers all the way down through Christian history, and even today, that have the kind of argument that you make. Such as Paul, I Paul I Paul. Ask you yeah. 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 Why do you deny it was Paul? I'll let you take it. No, because he's not going to the root. He's not going to the root. 
<coughs> to take control of the evil. Right. What do I have to do is see everything. I'll have to go ahead. I'm ready. I'll be so proud to be kicked out. I'm paying to kick him out. You have to follow. You, 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 you might find that if you if you don't interrupt me, you don't you won't you, you won't need to feel to interrupt me because I am going to address the point you make. There's been many examples down through Christian history of people that have held your view or made a similar point. However, Christian doctrine. Uh, or that, that, that whole opinion is simply contradicted by our own Lord's words. He said that wide is the path, easy is the way. Sorry, broad is the path, easy is the way, and short is the way that leads unto hell and damnation. But narrow is the path, long is the way, and difficult that leads unto salvation, and few there are that find it. So Christ is very clear. Not everyone is saved. Case closed. We don't, we interpret Paul's words based upon Jesus' words. We don't interpret Jesus' words based on Paul. Well, yeah. I, I go for Paul. Because I'm a spiritualist, okay? I'm a spiritualist and have absolute faith in the almighty power that gave me life and the immortal soul. Uh, and, and that's why and I of, go for Paul. And of course, Uncle, you're, you're welcome to that, but that's just not what the Bible teaches. Well, it's what taught me. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to clarify the point you made earlier about the plants. You alluded to the categorical imperative. I wasn't sure exactly what you were getting at. Were you critiquing that form of moral reasoning? No, Nietzsche was. Okay, and uh, could you just clarify exactly what he's talking So Nietzsche, Nietzsche, was, Nietzsche was, was critiquing the idea that through certain principles like categorical imperative, you could construct a moral system that everyone could follow. Because bearing in mind, nature is all about ripping, it's, it's all about washing away the horizon. It's all about uncoupling the earth from its sun. It's all about wiping away everything that we understand and making the slate clean. So that, having swept everything to one side, he can then stop writing again. So, he sees things like, you know, um, these sort of um, uh, moralistic structures like the utilitarian ethic and um, the categorical imperative. The, these kind of structures, they just get in the way of that because what they're doing is they're just another form of slave morality that will prevent the arising of the human age. I don't, I, yeah, that's, I just don't agree with that. You don't agree with Nietzsche? That. I don't agree no, with Nietzsche. But, but then I want to, or do you think I've misunderstood Nietzsche? No, 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 I think you're correct. And what I wanted to pull up then, is that I, I think we're on the same page, is I see a lot of Kantian intuitionism almost on par with revelation that a uh, Christian would And I, I wondered whether you see a difference or do you see similarities? The thing, the thing that betrays the fact that Nietzsche never managed to truly separate himself from his Christian heritage. Remember, he said all moral systems have a history. If we know the history, we know the origin, we know the origin, we know the quality of the thing. But what betrays the fact that he never managed to separate himself from that Christian heritage is that he was dedicated to finding the truth. Which A, presumes that there is a truth to find. B, that you can find it. And C, that, that it is of value. And those are all Christian ideas. It's those very Christian ideas that gave birth to the rise of the natural sciences in Western civilization. The idea that nature was created by a rational God whom you could get to know by exploring nature because those, those laws that the lawgiver gave would mean predictability. And that is the very the, the rubric that the natural philosophers were following and why we have the birth of natural science in Western civilization. And, and, and the precedence that it has taken in our culture, rooted in that Christian understanding of the world. So if we get to the same end, it doesn't matter whether I believe this or not. Well, what do you think the end is? No, yeah. Yeah, because I don't think, I, 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 I think if you think that you can get to an end that doesn't include God, then we're not aiming at the same place. We're aiming at two different places. 
I am not aiming at being a good person for being a good person's sake. I'm aiming to follow my Lord. That will mean, that will very much mean, because Christ promised that, that if we follow our Lord, the world will defame us. The world will accuse us. The world will say, you are not a good person. And that's what happened to the first Christians. They were considered atheists. They were considered um, a, a malevol malevolent influence in the Roman Empire because they would not sacrifice to Caesar and to the gods. They were considered to be bad. And in the Islamic Caliphates, Christians were considered to be bad because we were worshippers of a polytheistic God. So being a Christian, being a follower of your Lord, is not about being a good person in the eyes of society or by some model. It's about following your Lord. I see you laughing. I do see you. <laughs> what, what, what makes you laugh? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> Again. Is that the <laughs> yeah, In the Quran it says that if you don't recognize Jesus as God, but still worship the Almighty, you are considered a Muslim. Because by definition, a Muslim is someone who reveres okay. the Almighty. Thank you. Okay. And your point? The point is that no fundamentalist Muslim or, or should ever kill a Christian who uh, accepts that rule. So, you know, that it would appear that some Muslims will kill Christians just because they are Christians without asking this fundamental tenet of the Quran. Well, I mean, in the Quran it says, let there be no compulsion in religion. But Muslims, as they understand Islam, don't just use the Quran, they use a secondary set of literature called hadiths through the Quran. So, for example, the Quran says pray, but it doesn't say how, where, or when. You get all of that from the hadiths. And in those same hadiths that are used to tell Muslims to pray how, where, and when, it says this, that a Muslim can be killed for one of three reasons. One, if they commit murder. Two, if they commit adultery. And three, if they leave the religion of Islam. So if a Christian has left the religion of Islam under Islamic apostasy laws, what should happen to them? According to the hadith literature, they should be killed. And there are countless examples, both today and down through 1400 years of Islamic history, where Christians have died for simply choosing to be Christian and leaving the religion of Islam. And the church has many martyrs that we celebrate for that very reason. So I think that the, the idea of, it's a noble thing to try and see the best in everyone. And that is a, a noble intention. But that shouldn't blind us to reality. Remember what we said about suprasni, This idea of having a realistic assessment of the self. Of reality. Of yourself in reality. Well, we need some of that in our political discourse in the West. Because we are being driven by a utopian vision. Which whilst being well intentioned is not seeing the world as it truly is. But why do you need God so much, personally? Why do you, why do you need it? Well, usually people, when they want, when they get involved with religion, it's usually from a need, like something that's not, not really, you don't, they need to fill a need that some kind. Why, why do you need religion so much, as well, a person? Personally, I became a Christian because I'm Muslim, actually. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I became a Christian because I'm Muslim. <laughs> yeah. I became a Christian because I'm Muslim. So, yeah. That's why I, how I became a Christian. What? So, so he, he, he was a big fan of a guy called Ahmed Dida, and he, he liked to come and to argue with me about Christianity. And he thought because I was white, that meant I was Christian. I mean, uh, to be fair to him, we were all in high school, young and naive and silly. Um, and he would, he would come and he would argue. And I felt that he was attacking something that was British. 
And at that time, that was where my identity was, Britishness. And so I felt the need to defend that Britishness. And so as I started to try and defend it, and I lost completely in, in every debate and in every discussion, it drove me to dig into what the Christian faith was. And as I dug into it, and as I, I read about it, and I learned about it, I became a Christian. So, you know, I, in complete honesty, I, the thing that sort of catalyzed my journey of faith was the need to defend um, Britishness that, that I thought was being attacked. And in the process of, of doing that, I found a different identity that replaced that previous identity. Yeah, I <laughs> okay, we get back to the child. But can I just say something? That there's often the presumption amongst non Christians that, that Christians are just needy people who fall on God because they they have hard times. And that, whilst being true in, in certainly in some cases, absolutely, there's no denying that, many people actually become Christian um, not because of some radical event in their life that makes them question their own internal narrative but through a slow consideration of what Christianity is, where they replace one precept, one concept, one value with a Christian one and over time become Christian and then acknowledge that fact. And that's a much more reasoned process. So it's not the case that everyone just becomes Christian because they're in some emotional crisis. And it's unfair right. to characterize all True. Christians being like that. Right, there's always a catalyst. Of course, yeah, absolutely, there's always a catalyst. And it's interesting to be aware of that. Right? Yeah, Charles. Um, yeah, I'm just interested why they they are incompatible nationalism, well, uh, also patriotism and uh, um, Christianity. Um, so for instance, I've, I've been to been to Russia and I'd really like the Orthodox Church. It was beautiful, and I was sort of oh, I almost wish there was Russian so that I could enjoy the Orthodox Church. Not because you have to be Russian to get in, but it just didn't feel a uh, natural expression of who my culture and my language, especially. Whereas the Anglican Church definitely does stuff like that. Yeah, the, 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 the Orthodox Church would be the first to tell you that you don't have to be Russian to be Orthodox. No, I know, I'm not saying you don't, but what, what I mean is that um, what I, like, I wouldn't be able to go along and why? for the same way that like, I well, just wouldn't be able to go along in the same way that I, I just fit in a lot better in English. I've, I've been to all kinds of churches in all kinds that worship in all kinds of languages. If you understand the reality that you're engaging with, the language is pretty irrelevant. Okay, well, I, let's just say it's not, for me, it, it's not relevant. Um, but, look, but what's really wrong with it being, uh, like, connecting the two and your nation, as long as you just don't want your nation to fight someone else, what's, what's wrong with it? So, the, 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 I guess, yeah, that, and that's fair. <laughs> the kind of nationalism that I'm talking about is the, the nationalism that makes the idea of a national identity a god. The point, of, the point of the Christian faith is that it, it takes nations and it brings out the best in them and then those nations and the best in them become this mosaic that is called the church. There is a, a, a collection of all nations and all peoples gathered together in the church. But the, the reason why that contrasts with the nationalism I'm talking about is that when you speak with this particular kind of nationalist, they will say things like, you know, because it's English, it's best. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? And, and we should back England against anyone. And I'm saying, I'm saying that as a Christian, my loyalty lies elsewhere. My, if, if, if the United Kingdom were to attack a Christian community, I couldn't support the United Kingdom in doing that. Yeah. So, so, when so you therefore, you say, nationalism and Christianity are not compatible. The point you made earlier about not defining yourself as English or Scottish as Christianity, you just meant that in terms of not saying, not denying uh, Englishness or whatever. Yeah, when I bring it below Christianity. Yeah. So when I, when I become a Christian, I, I throw off my old allegiances to anything English. But, Completely. Yeah, but into the church, I bring what is English. And, and I consecrate what is English to the service of the Christ. And so does an Armenian, and so does an Ethiopian, and so does a Serbian, and so does an Italian, and so does a Russian, and so does a Peruvian, and so does uh, a Nigerian. 
They bring what they are into the church, but they have no allegiance to it. What they are is now at the service of the thing that they have allegiance to. You guys bored yet? Okay, I'll keep going if you want me to keep going. Looking at what you have to stop, I mean, I, I, I'll keep going until you guys want me to stop. Um, yeah, I'm also. Uh, I, I really don't mean to fundamentally challenge you. You know, more than you're, you're, No, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, uh, sorry, I'm just afraid that I don't mean to come across as a grasp. Um, Trust me, you can tell me I'm across as a grasp. What do you think makes Christianity, uh, what puts it above other religions? What makes Christian because it's true. It's fundamentally oh, yeah. true. And, yes. and, and that sounds like such a, 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 a blasé assertion. In a big yard, yeah. yeah, but in terms of, in term, if we define truth as that which corresponds closest to reality, would you agree that that's a fair definition of truth? Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of the, the, the Christian narrative, it starts off by saying that human beings are innately selfish and self-interested creatures. And I think that there is more than sufficient evidence for me to say that that's a fact. The human beings believe themselves, each one of us here, see ourselves as at the center of the world and that everyone else is around them. Is that not true? That's perceptively true. And in terms of our own life, do we not measure things by how they affect us? Human beings are innately selfish creatures. Sometimes that selfishness produces altruism but that altruism is produced precisely because of some self-preservation. Yeah, so by nature we are selfish. And this is the description that the Christian meta-narrative gives to humanity. But that selfishness also separates them from the divine. Christianity says you cannot find your way to God. And every attempt by mankind to find God fails. That's why you'll never find God through some scientific means. Because ultimately, you cannot find God, God finds you. And God is the one that redeems you. It's His Holy Spirit and His grace that allows you to perceive reality for what it is, not your own ability. But then I, I'm, not, I'm not fully certain why that then equates to a Christian God. Well, and, and all of the laws so, that come along. By them. contrast. So you have to do the contrast. Yeah. So. If you, let's contrast it with Buddhism. Christianity and Buddhism say that suffering is a reality, okay? The Buddha, as I understand the Buddha's teaching, says that the reason why you suffer is because of an illusion of attachment. So in other words, if your child is dying in the crib, the reason why that causes you pain is because you imagine that you are attached to your child. If you can recognize that you have no attachment to your child, you will not suffer, and thus, through your disattachment to the world around you, you can escape the cycle of birth and rebirth and achieve nirvana, which is nothingness. Mm -hmm. By contrast, now, now, this is the thing, this is where you do your thought experiment. Is that description of reality, does that resonate as true with you? Or when you think of, you do the thought experiment, and you think of your child as suffering in the crib, do you feel that it is true that that child is a part of you that does belong to you and that it is not wrong to be attached to the child. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with your point. Right, and that's the Christian perspective. The Christian perspective is that the, the suffering that we see in the world is not something that we should seek to separate ourselves from or escape from, which is why Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity was wrong. Yeah. The suffering of the world that, that, that is confronted in the world, Christ simply instructs us towards a pragmatic compassion, a practical, everyday compassion. If you see someone hungry, you give them food. If you see someone thirsty, you give them something to drink. Obviously, complications can arise at societal levels and you need to tackle it differently, but essentially, the pragmatic is the same. Out of those two descriptions of reality, which one resonates as being true? You want to? But I think I think that I think the fact that it doesn't that it doesn't resonate with the reality of the world around us, that it doesn't resonate 
with our own nature in a way that makes sense, is indicating something. I think the reason that Christianity is true is because the merit and narrative of the Christian faith is ultimately real. It's really for everyone if you're not religious. It's like, well, it, I'm just going to look after my child. You know, I'm conscious that that lady in the back did so say that. Yeah, uh, there are actually three bunch of questions. The first one, anyway, then we will back to Andy and then they should. Uh, one thing is uh, Buddhism emerged because Buddha and his disciples later on said that we are against caste system of Hinduism. Hinduism was imposing the four castes mainly and it was imposing the suffering as if means common people can suffer but the ruling parties or the governing bodies they won't they shouldn't suffer. Buddha was against that and Buddha was against the caste system vehemently. He emphasized that this caste system must die. That wasn't the only thing. Uh, no, no. Was it the uh, only uh, what? That wasn't the only reason why Buddhism emerged. Uh, that was one of the major reasons. Yeah, it was also and because then, apparently then, aesthetic practices. Of Buddhism the, is no. very, very practical because it didn't only say about Nirvana. It also said about the middle path that there, there should there will be hunger, there will be suffering. But we will need to balance between these uh, extreme things. So you can't measure Christianity is uh, bigger or superior than Buddhism. I adore Christianity very much because Christ was a genuinely good person. But the way you are saying that Christianity, uh, it's the followers are saying that the Christianity is superior than other uh, religion. I think you've misheard me, to be honest. You've misheard me. I said, that in reply to the question, why is Christianity true and other religions are false? I said, oh, how could we distinguish it? I can't, I don't want to miss Yeah, um, so why, why would one be true? And yeah, exactly. So that was the question that I was answering. And I'm saying that the reason why I believe Christianity to be true is because the meta-narrative of Christianity is that which corresponds to reality. Whereas I don't find that true of Buddhism. I don't believe that Buddhism truly corresponds to reality. Like Marxism does not correspond to reality. Like Nazism does not con correspond to reality. There, anyone can believe anything, but just because you believe something, it doesn't mean that it corresponds to reality. And I believe that in, in, in every point of Christian belief, there is a correspondence to reality. So, can you just add to this? Wait, but it, hold on a second. Can we receive? There were other people that. Put yeah, and there's. So, um, you need to speak to your real background. I'll get back to you. Yeah, thank you. So, I just have, um, I have three questions. Um, one is about the Christian In that way, so many other nationalities come to the church with the So why does it, why does why does this idea of um, God have to be contained within the church? Why do they have to come to the church with the nationality? Why why the church basically? I uh, to be clear, you don't. Why why why? Let me just put my hands on this and forget it. Why can't it be just like this idea of um, like a unifying God, or what is it? I mean, it doesn't have to be a person either, like, because it can be just a being, or it, it, it's not necessary for it to be contained within the church. So, in, in terms of the, the why they come to the church, firstly, the church has its institutions, which, to confuse everybody, we call churches, which doesn't help to, to, to what I'm about to say. But the church isn't an institution. The church is a people. So when you become a Christian, you become part of the church and you bring into the church everything that you are in service of your new God. 
So it's not that you come to an institution, it's that you become a new people. And the reason why that must happen is because if you have a, a, a meta-narrative that is shared by other people, and that meta-narrative connects you to a history that is shared by other people, and that meta-narrative and that history predicate certain values and moral principles that are then shared with other people, that means that you are a people. And if you are a people, then that's why it's the church, and it's an inescapable consequence of aiming your life towards the same telos. If you're all moving in the same direction, the closer you get to that telos, the closer you get to one another. I think that the understanding of Christian truth there's two ways you can understand truth. You can see it as a fence that has boundaries, or you can see it as a, a fire in the middle of a field. If you see it as boundaries, then you can either break the boundaries or not. If you see it as a fire, then you see it uh, as a, a light and a source of life and heat and warmth in the middle that you can be closer to or further from. The Christian journey is essentially calling people to come closer to the fire, so that by coming closer to the fire, they become more illuminated by its light, more warmed by its heat, and more energized by its energy. So, in terms of our understanding of God, why can't it be this, why can't it be that? It seems to me that what belies that question is, is some assertion or assumption that God is something that we invent. And I'm adamant that the Christian God is not an invention. The Christian God has revealed himself to us in a certain way, and we cannot invent him according to how we might want him to be. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I, mean, I, I agree with what like, you're saying that God, perceiving God is not an invention. Um, but I, I don't think, like, I guess I like, um, I don't think that the fire, the men were able to use the fire um, and the people coming to the fire um, for uh, illumination. I don't think that necessarily only can be confounded with just Christianity or religion. And, yeah. and you're saying that church is just a people coming together mm. um, for a certain theology. It's also, it can be applied to different religions because you could just say like people are coming together where then the, the idea of church doesn't really stay within Christianity yeah. because it can be applied to various other religions. Yeah, so the... I'm just going to move on to so when this yeah. question actually. Um, can I address that point and then you bring in your question? Yeah, go ahead. Unless the question is connected to the point. No, 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 it's not. Okay, so yeah, it, it's true that there, you, you can look at all the religions, as I've been as a religious studies student, from a sociological point of view, and you can find common traits amongst them. But that's not the point. The point is, what is the truth? It is not simply to say, well, this religion provides charity, and that religion provides charity, so therefore the two religions are the same. If this religion provides charity, but says that God is just a consciousness. And that religion provides charity and says that God is a noble, personable being. That is a different statement about metaphysics. And then the question is, which of those statements are true? Because I would say that we have an obligation to be as close to the truth as we possibly can in every possible way. If you believe that truth is a real thing. And if you don't believe that truth is a real thing, then you have a crisis of epistemology. Hey. Yeah, I, I would like to, as a spiritualist, I, I would like to point out that, well, I, well, I can't, I can't start saying we, I, try to find the light in everything. It, I would try to understand how it was possible for the Aztecs to sacrifice uh, warriors that have been captured, or their understanding of reality, and why it is that uh, nations will sacrifice countless young men in their name to sustain their power. 
Nazis. Now, I, I would like to point this out about the, the Nazis, or the so-called Nazis, that, or Hitler's version of national socialism stems from the origin of the species, because Darwin, the subtitle is The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. So as you see ethnic cleansing throughout the world, you, you, you can see that it's based on that principle, the natural principle of survival of species, and then it extends to races. He didn't say species, but man is a species, he called it a race. And he himself would have witnessed the demise of races under imperialist power. Millions upon countless millions have been uh, murdered in North and South America and elsewhere in the world on the basis of nationalism and imperialism. It's an absolutely so tragic the basis question? of human activity. Yes. Jesus, yeah. Jesus said, Daniel, Jesus sorry. said, you cannot fight for the kingdom of heaven with a sword. He said, go, he said to one of his disciples, Peter, he said, go and get a sword with your money. What's the question of the point? Because the point is, I'm trying to say that the world is as it is. You cannot isolate nations at all. They are all subject to the same colossal struggle for power. Rich. What I'm saying is that Jesus opposed this, and I can say it from the testimony. Okay, so you wish to answer this? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm trying to answer it for you. I'm well, then you. perhaps you should come here and talk to yourself then. No. <laughs> To myself, because you might, on that principle, you might talk. To I might again interrupt here. No, no, he's denying my democratic right. This is an open Andy. debate. No. It's an open debate. It is not an open debate. But you, well, when, yes, 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 when you said, debate, when you said that you're answering, when you said you're answering it for yourself, you called down the debate. I'm sorry, but when you said I will answer it for you, you closed down the debate. I told you the answer, just the same way as I hope you could have given Andy, us please. the answer. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can, I, can I address some of what you said? Sure. So, so, so the point is, the kind of, the kind of humanist ethic that has been brought into um, certain modern religions, he said that he would try to understand how different religions would lead to truth. You know, you would try to understand the realities of the aspects of sacrifice. Any group that tries to universalize and homogenize all the different religions into one will be using some rubric that they are asserting over all the other religions. So in other words, they are recasting them according to a rubric that they believe in. And a perfect example of that would be the Baha'i faith. I've known many Baha'is and I have a lot of respect for Baha'is and just for the record, the Baha'is are horrendously persecuted in Iran and are well deserving of people's solidarity. But the Baha'is, for their belief system, will say that all the religions lead to God. And when you dig into what they believe, they literally just reinterpret every religion which is not an authentic engagement with what those religions are saying about themselves. And it's the same kind of nonsense that the liberals perform when they talk about three Abrahamic faiths and how all the religions essentially teach the same. They are taking humanism and imposing humanism and seeing humanism in all the religions. So in other words, what they're doing is like a virus, they're infecting all the religions with what they think the religion should say, rather than truly engaging with what the religions say about themselves. When, as a religious study student, you do that, you realize that it's all a nonsense. This idea of a common humanity, it's rubbish, it doesn't exist. There are different humanities with different understandings of what it is to be human and different ways of expressing that. And yes, we are living in a time where everything's being put into a giant melting pot of globalization and marketing and commercialization of everything. But that reality, when you look at the texts, Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, they teach and believe different things. And they construct being human differently. 
So you have a real choice. Which kind of human do you want to be? And then when you've made that choice, how important is that choice to you? And how much are you willing to stake to defend it? Yes, James. Um, so the point you're making about being unpopular for saying some of the things that the Christian feels that they should say based on their idea of truth. And I can think of some examples where um, Christians do do that or should do that and they, and they would become unpopular. I think that seems like uh, good. So it's like something that maybe they would think about adultery or, or abortion, perhaps a, a classic cases when Christians are very unpopular for what they say. Um, but I was wondering, I guess what I was thinking about was the, the struggle with um, homosexuality now in terms of uh, the church saying that it's um, a sin, that it's a bad thing, that, yeah, it, um, I don't see it as being, a, as being a sort of a, something that uh, the church can kind of get anywhere with, um, you look at how destructive the debate around gay marriage has been for the church's reputation in terms of those people who have yeah, I think, but I think the idea of understanding identity on the basis of one's sexuality is a very modern thing. And we often retrospect, we often ahistorically and anachronistically project back our categories of understanding into the past. The church condemned and does condemn the practice of homosexual sex. It doesn't understand homosexuality as an identity. It understands, yeah, yeah. it understands that people are sinful and sin. And the, the reason why that is destructive, I think, for the church is because there are some Christians who want to go along with the culture and there are some Christians who want to be faithful to the teachings of the Christian faith. And that's where the destructiveness comes in because those who want to go along with the culture have not been discipled properly in understanding the faith or in their willingness to defend it. I can see that, I guess I, I meant sort of the, the destructive uh, debate that would, that would result from that. Can I just talk about the reputation point? Sorry. Okay. Just very briefly. Yeah. Because it was something that you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's important. My, my answer to that is the church shouldn't care about reputation. 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 So it is damaging to our reputation to hold certain views that we do. And yeah. my answer to that is, who cares? Uh, I guess um, I, I, I acknowledge that with things like uh, perhaps abortion, divorce. Why is, why is the question of homosexuality? Because because it's because, it's why is the question of uh, the, the act of homosexuality any different? Well, I think it's more than just destructive to reputation. Reputation, I think, is really destructive to um, how many people this, like, can come to church and have faith. I'm not quite sure how that follows. Well, just, it just from my own experience. I mean, the thing is that the reason why most people have the views that they do is because the media is being controlled by those that, that push the liberal worldview. You control the, the, the means of communication, you control the worldview that people have. This is about politics. It's not about, it's not about, it's not, it, it's, it's about cult, the forming of cultures. Well, I mean, I mean, you mentioned politics. I mean, could, could it be like the church should be quiet about homosexuality? Well, can I can I can I be honest with you? Like, because this is a liberal media presentation of the church. I go to church every Sunday, and I'll be honest with you. I think in all the years that I've been a Christian, I've heard maybe one or two sermons on this issue. The church is not always banging on about this issue. The fact is that when the liberal media are in front of a bishop, that's the issue that the media always go to. Yeah. And so it appears that Christians are always talking about it. But the, reality it is, well. but the reality is Christians don't always go on about it. And actually, most Christians would be very welcoming of people, um, you know, who are homosexual. We're not, we've not got some kind of, you know, animus. We are described as having animus. I, I understand. So, okay, um, you might say if there are some, some opinions, if not opinions, like, uh, uh, principles of Islam, that a lot of uh, Muslims don't talk about very often. 
that you find to be very problematic, let's say. Yes. So you're allowed to question them on those. Of course. Things. Yeah. And people can do that for Christianity. Right. right. And what should Christianity say at that point? If if if, it, if they're going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm always thinking it politically. The the, uh, the debate around the gay marriage and the yeah. was was really destructive for the churches. Not just reputation, but like how many people now like continue to go to church or whatever because. I actually don't think you're right. I don't. I don't know many Christians. I don't know, know many Christians who abandon the faith because of the gay marriage issue. They're not abandoned, but they would, would, would go to people sitting on the fence. Yeah, yeah. There, there are people sitting on the fence. That's true. Yeah. But that's a question. Of, the real issue is the question of discipleship. In that there are some people within the church who are not sufficiently discipled to stand on the faith. Paul says that you should examine yourself to see if you remain in the faith. That means that you examine your motives, your intentions, your desires, and, it, and you're examining your worldview. In terms of catechesis, we need to do a better job within the church of raising people up to have Christian values within the church, and then to be able to defend those values rationally to an unbelieving world. The damage comes when the discipleship is poor and people go along with the culture rather than with the apostolic teaching. And nothing that I have said should be interpreted as me having any animus against a collective of people known as homosexuals. Because I do not see them that way. I see people as people, we're all sinners, and we all need the same saviour. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like I have exhausted all of the questions. I believe. Right. Okay. If if I mean anyone who wants anyone who wants to have a drink afterwards, we will find a place no for far until until the wee hours of the morning. Um, if that is your inclination. Uh, so yeah, I mean before we get on, this we'll just ask an announcement. Uh, first, definitely, yeah, we will be heading to checkpoint. So those willing, I mean, can come along and have a few drinks and dinner with us. Uh, secondly, uh, relating to the event we hosting tomorrow, uh, Bob will be evangelizing at, uh, at the coronation walk at Meadows from 11 o'clock if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, so finally, if you wish to come along, uh, join in for the debate, uh, there'll be... Bring your Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there'll be, you know, other, other things. <laughs> It'll be more along the theme for Ask Christian a Question, uh, or yeah. Questions in Christianity. Yeah, basically, I'll just, I'll just do what I've just done now with other people. Just How like, long is it all? Until I get bored. Until you get Exactly, until you get exhausted. Yeah, it'd be amazing. Uh, I, mean, I will probably do it for about two hours, because yeah. right. it'll be cold, yeah. and I won't want to stand now for a long time. But then afterwards, if anyone, like I say, like, you know, I, 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 I want to say thank you very much that you, you've taken such a long time out in your evening tonight and for engaging in the conversation in a mature and adult way. Um, with some of the conversation that I had with Richard before coming here, I was half expecting to get pelted. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I uh, and, and the, 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 the nature of the kind of question and answer session that we've done is that there'll be loose ends and there'll be parts of the picture but not a full picture. You know, you might have a shard of a stained glass window but not be able to see where the shard fits into the wire frame. So if you are having asked a question left with several more questions and you want to be able to engage further and, and look more into it, then I'll be able to give you an email address and we can correspond and we can talk and we can until you're, you're satisfied that your curiosity spot has been gone through the scratch. Uh, on that note, also before we head out, I just have to give a word of thanks, especially to my friends. I usually John, Charles for helping me out and organize this. And thank you all in the audience for coming along uh, for the events and thanks a lot to Mr. Lee for the venue. Thank you so much. And on such a short note that really uh, I did like them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the cameraman, Mr. Jesse, and of course, uh, in the end, the uh, word of thanks and a great appreciation for such an insightful talk to Bob. Thank you so much.